So hello there. Uh, my name is Deborah Rosinski. I'm executive director of Bainbridge Arts and Crafts, and it's my distinct pleasure today to have Morgan Brigg here for a discussion about her work and process and um, background and influences. And uh, Morgan, your, your work is so unique and full of life and emotion and character. And uh, I'd love to hear direct from you more about kind of what, what was the instigating force in your life that led you to where you are. <laughs> uh, All right. Why don't you dive in? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm excited about the show, first of all. But um, what got me started? Well, I started out as a graphic designer um, years and years ago. And um, I think what I loved about being a graphic designer, most of all, was that process of going in and hearing the client's story first, because they had either a product to sell or an image to convey. And so it was me going in and listening to what they had to say. And many times it was pretty passionate stuff and full of emotion. And I love taking all of that and then transferring it using my, my knowledge of symbols and of visuals and transferring that into something for them to use. And so I did that for about 15 years and I started to notice uh, towards the end of those 15 years that even though I loved hearing their stories initially, what I really wanted to do was tell my own story. So, um, and what I wanted from that was to be able to connect to um, other people and to just have that bond that hopefully would happen um, by telling my own story. Um, and so what happened was actually about that, I, well, I really wanted to do it, but I was also terrified to make that leap from graphic design into the fine arts. And about that same time, my dad was diagnosed with um, cancer and it was, he was diagnosed pretty late with it. And so one day I was sitting with him bedside and this was like a week before he passed. And he said to me, you know, I've had this really great life and I have absolutely no regrets. And that part about no regrets just hit me like a ton of bricks. I thought, man, you know, what's going to happen is I'm going to get to the end of my life. And if I haven't taken action on this, then I'm going to have a huge regret of not doing it. So in that moment, it became not if I was going to do it, but when I was going to do it. And so I figured out how I was going to go about it. Um, and within a couple of years, I just made the leap into the fine arts and started telling my story. Only I realized that I was kind of terrified of telling my story <laughs> because I thought, oh, my gosh, people are going to know what's really inside me. And I'm so weird inside. <laughs> it's going to be people are going to run, you know. <laughs> and so um it took a while to, um, you know, little by little to go ahead and start telling my story through my figures and everything else I was creating. And what I found ultimately was that I'm really normal. <laughs> that, that, and, and if I'm crazy, then everyone else is wacko too. And I love that. I love that there's this, you know, there's a bonding there and there's people that identify when they look at the work and they say, oh yeah, I, I totally get where you're coming from. So, so yeah, um, that was kind of my leap into the fine arts and, um, and at the time I was creating um, masks and I was doing it initially out of paper mache and kind of inspired by the Inuit, um, the way they would attach all kinds of creatures or they would attach different things to the outside perimeter of the mask. And I was starting to get into the copper aspect of, of materials that I love to use. And I learned at that time how to, um, how to form 
um, the face part and how to hammer it. There was a friend of mine who did a lot of welding and a lot of forming of uh, steel. And so he took me and showed me how to just um, anneal the copper and get it soft and then start hammering on it. And I kind of took it from there and I realized that the process of creating these faces and of the artwork in general really released a lot of inner, um, I, I guess it was unknown to me at first. I mean, it wasn't consciously known like emotions or feelings or things that I've gone through in my life. And um, I was fascinated by that aspect that as one does their artwork, it just, it just allows for all this stuff to come out and be expressed. And maybe at the first, I would see something come out and not know exactly what it was, but as I would be spend time with the pieces, I'd know more and more, oh, this is about this aspect of my life, or this is what I'm feeling now. And yeah, it was just really, really exciting to, um, I mean, it was a little frightening too, because it's like, ah, oh, what's going to come up now? But for the most part, it was, um, it was exploratory. And um, I felt like I was on an adventure. And then that was also when um, I started getting connected to others when they would view the work and say, yeah, it, you know, I know what you're talking about. So, um, Anyway, from there, I, I learned the copper and um, I also took a welding class at one of the local colleges. Um, and I remember at the time asking, cause we were working on steel then. And I asked the teacher, well, isn't there a way to put copper to copper? And, and I remember he said, no, you, you, you fry it. it. It would dissipate. And I thought, well, that's, that can't possibly be right. And so for about a couple of months after that, I was like, what? I, I just wonder how to do it. And then pretty soon I found a, a teacher who was um, displaying some of his work at Alaskan Copper and Brass, where I bought my copper. And um, I called him up and asked him if he would explain it or show me and give me some lessons on how to braise copper to copper. And because he was doing it so that it did not even look like there was a silver solder seam or anything. It was just, it just looked unified. And that's exactly what I wanted. So um, he agreed. And I was able to learn within a couple of several hour lessons. And from there, it was, um, I kind of started moving away from um, just playing the copper mass. And I started building and fabricating bodies out of copper. And, and so, yeah. So I really, it really kind of opened it up for me to start playing with the copper and being able to braise it together and to create different parts that were more 3D um, than what I was doing originally. Um, really amazing combination of techniques that you use. I mean, kind of part jewelry making techniques, like you use enamel on copper as well, right? And yeah, I had um, I had another friend that um, who knew how to, or they said they knew how to enamel with a torch, which kind of wasn't true. But I got <laughs> the sense from just working with them um, how to fire because the enamel comes in a powdered format. And so there's, you sprinkle that on top of the clean copper. And then I was torching everything. So I would, and using an oxyacetylene torch. And so I would fire it from underneath and, um, and that would fuse and molten, create the molten enamel. So it would fuse onto the copper uh, surface. And so, yes, I mean, I really focused on that enameling for, quite a few years and did layers upon layers of enamel using the torch. Um, and then after the enamel was on, I would braise the parts together, um, which was tricky because the enamel wanted to turn molten again at the, about the same temperature that you were fusing um, or that you were braising the copper, other copper pieces to it. But, you know, I figured it out. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, yeah, that was my path for, for years and years and years. And then finally it got to the point where um, I realized that I was kind of tired of trying to figure out how to 
to hammer a, a face that there was so much complexity in working it from behind and it just took forever to do it was very labor intensive and so i took a pottery class and learned to um form the heads with um with a low fire clay and um and then those would be fired and then um, glazed in any way you, you wanted. And then I also started figuring out, because I was like, I wonder if I can um, bring the copper to that after the clay's been fired. I wonder if I can reheat the, um, the clay and somehow, you know, either fuse the copper to it, which that didn't work, but um, or at, what I ended up doing was um, shooting a copper rod through two holes in the side of the neck of the piece. And then I would fuse a copper piece of a collar around that neck. And then from there, I would have a copper neck that I could attach a copper body to because the, come to find out that the fired clay would in fact take a lot of heat from a torch as long as you came into it real gradual and uh, so that was another thing that freed me to you know really mix my materials because I love the idea of um, a copper or I mean a, um, a clay head that had all this glazing on it and then mix it down with with the metal that had a completely different feel to it so yeah, so then I, I worked with that for a number of years and um, and then I got even lazier, I guess. <laughs> so I just thought, you know, I wonder if there's a way to use another clay that doesn't need to be fired. And, um, and so I started researching that and it turns out there was an artist that I found who was using some uh, resin clay. And I thought, oh, I, I've done resin before and I don't, I don't wanna go there because it's really labor intensive. But there it turns out there was um, an epoxy um, clay and it's a uh, two part epoxy clay um, so that you just mix it together. And once you mix those parts, you have about an hour and a half max to work with it before it starts to stiffen up to the degree that you really can't push it around too much anymore. And um, so that's that that clay is called epoxy sculpt. And I've been using it lately um, around a whole bunch of different things. And it is also a great adhesive. It will adhere pretty much anything to anything like glass. It will adhere even, you know, organic things. It's just anything to anything. So all the, my love of found objects is, um, is fair game because you can really freely just attach anything and that clay will hold on to it. So um, that's kind of where I'm at now is uh, I'm still loving the copper parts and I still use a lot of copper in my work. In, in many cases, it's, it's body parts like antlers or arms or um, noses and ears and that kind of thing. And you're using some graphics processes too, right? Um, like imagery transfers? Yeah. There's, I found out about um, transfers a uh, long time ago, maybe 15 years ago. And, and what you can do with those um, is you can uh, select images and then run them through your, um, your printer, an inkjet printer. And uh, it's, so it's, it's a decal basically. And what you have to do once it's been printed the image has been printed is you have to seal the image with a clear uh, spray uh, acrylic. And so you get several coats of that going on there. And then you can cut out those images or use them as a big sheet and you can soak them in water and the image will stay because it's been sealed. Uh, and then you basically slide the image off onto whatever. And for me, Initially, it started out with, with creating a base of a white enamel on top of the copper. Um, and then I would slide the decal onto that because the decal has a transparent quality to it in the areas, uh, certain areas that 
are white supposedly and so anything that you put it on top of will um, show through so even colorized enamels and i played with that um, you can slide those onto it too and create real antique feel to that image and now you can even do it on top of spray paint and you white spray paint you can also do it on top of um, the clay itself as long as there's a smooth enough surface that everything doesn't, uh, that it adheres properly. So yeah, that's been, um, that's, yeah, that my graphic designer inside of me that still lives <laughs> wants to grab, you know, images from other places, distort them and, and print them out and then create all sorts of different imagery on the actual surface. So it's really almost like a 3D collage after a while, what I do. It's, it's really sticking so many different materials and things together. But I like that differences that appears when you when you really are using diverse, diverse materials. Yeah, I really haven't seen anybody work quite the way that you do. You, you have a real almost like an illustrator sensibility in, in how the characters have so much life to them and um, all the details that you add. I, I'm just so fascinated <laughs> by, <laughs> by how rich they are. I mean, there's just so much going on. So I was curious if you had studied illustration. Uh, it sounds like you studied graphic design at art. Yes, Center. I was a uh, graphic designer um, was my main thing. And when I did go to school for uh, graphic design, I specialized in packaging. So I was um, uh, really focused more on food packaging and um, other product packaging. Um, but yeah, I, I, initially I did a little bit of study as an illustrator, but decided it wasn't kind of my thing way back then. Uh, but I guess that shifted somewhat, <laughs> but I do love the idea. I mean, it's the collage magic magic is what happens. And, and especially when you start messing around with eyes or mouth or different, you know, I mean, you can take like a left eye and use it as a right eye. And then you get this really weird thing going on. And I just, I love that kind of stuff because you don't know what's going to appear and you don't know what expression is going to come out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it's like the strangest things because you, you, you know, like that left eye for the right eye thing. It's like, well, that's not normal, but but your brain wants to make it normal when it views it. And so it's sort of, it does, it makes it go, Oh, okay. That, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> but that underlying thing that something's off, I love that. <laughs> I love having people look at something and go, Oh, you know, isn't that sweet or that's cute. And then I've had someone say to me before, yeah, I just want to hug them at first when I see them. And then when I have them up close to me, I find them very disturbing and I want to <laughs> hurry and put them down. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's, that's, you know, a high compliment because that's what I want. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> uh, yeah, it's making me think of David Lynch <laughs> movies where he <laughs> films things backwards and then plays them forward and it, it gives things kind of an otherworldly quality or something that because he just sort of shifts what you expect a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I really like um, that sense of duality, because I think that we all really live with a ton of duality all the time. I certainly do. You know, there might be, you know, like you might have fear of something, of trying something new on one hand, but there's this other side that wants to be the adventurer some and wants to be very courageous. And, and so you just somehow work it out. And I think also, like with grieving, there's also another part of being so happy that you had what you had, whatever it was. And then now that it's lost you, I don't know. It's again, there's always this overlap of the two different things going on, two different emotions going on. And that, boy, when I can capture that in, in a piece, that's just like a home run. It's um, It's always very, very challenging, but it's kind of the, the gold you know, the gold standard in my book, at least. Yeah. So do the pieces really evolve before your eyes as you go and they kind of, kind of lead you in a way, would you say? Yes. I'm not, I'm not 
I used, when I first started, I would draw things out and really try and plan everything because I was, I think a huge part of that was because I was just really learning the copper and I was learning the glass of the enamel and you really, boy, you, you had to do certain steps first and you had to do like all the torch steps first before you could um, bring in, you know, any kind of cold joinery or anything like that. So I really had to think ahead and draw things out um, until I got used to it. Uh, but now it's a free for all. <laughs> and I, I love having a lot of found objects out and the ones that I think I might use, but maybe not. And then, uh, and then with the clay, the epoxy sculpt clay, it's a, it's more forgiving, I think, than the clay that you fire because you can keep coming back. Like you can initially create something, but then if you want to change it, you don't have to keep the clay wet like you would with a, with a fired clay. You can come back in at any stage with just a little more mixing of, of the two parts and, and just keep adding, 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 or, you know, sawing something off and then, you know, switching it around and, and then re reconnecting it. So it's, it's wonderfully forgiving that way. And, and that's the way I work. It's kind of like, well, whatever's going to come out come, is going to come out and I'm not going to worry about it. And if it's something I really don't like, then I'll just, you know, cut it apart and put something else on it until it's something that resonates. Mm -hmm. So I very much, I very much work like that now. And, and that's part of the adventure of it too, is to see what does come out. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times it's that subconscious thing again, that you like when a lot of political <laughs> turmoil was going on a few a year or so ago. And um and I was doing a lot of pieces that had like teeth <laughs> and they were really like, you know, kind of pissed off stuff. And I <laughs> I was like, what what is going on? Where is this coming from? And then you know it dawned on me, oh okay. Well, that's cool. It's a nice way to get it out of your system because <laughs> there's no other way to get it out of your system. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a very telling process. I think most artists find that when they do their work that it's, you know, all sorts of stuff comes up and that's, you get to clear it out and that's the joy of, of being able to work like this. Yeah. It's very true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that epoxy clay sounds really freeing I have to say it sounds really cool <laughs> yeah it's great because um it cures in 24 hours and then you can you can sand it you can drill it and screw into it um like I said you can you can cut into it and saw into it and take off parts or you can grind it down you can also kind of scratch into it and do a lot of times I will do that in surface of adding writing or adding symbols, um, all sorts of things. So it's, and then it also takes the paint really well. So you can layer and layer and layer and wipe things down and then layer some more. And that's, um, that's a huge part of what I enjoy about the clay. Now you can really put some nice textures in and uh, yeah, it's, it seems like it's pretty much wide open field. Yeah, the pieces have this kind of patina of age or, or lived experience to them. And I love, yeah, I really love that older look. And I love the way found objects can be adhered into that and continue that idea of something that's that's not fresh out of the box. It's been around and it's already lived a lifetime. And um, so now it's, yeah, it's bringing a whole nother level of, <laughs> of being lived in to this piece. So yeah, that's definitely a, an awesome part of, uh, of the materials. Yeah, do you teach at all these days or? Um... Yes, I've, I've been teaching um, through a company, Bellissima Artscapes. And, and um, so I teach, I end up teaching regionally here. And then I also, she likes to take groups down to Mexico or other places. And so I've taught down in Oaxaca and San Miguel um, for a number of years. 
And that's just always very delicious to be in a warm climate, you know, when it's not so great here. <laughs> but um, that's I, I love teaching. I love um, I love opening that up for other people and for, and especially the torching, the learning to braise, I think, because it's one of those things. Fire is one of those things that it's it's pretty terrifying for a lot of people initially. But once you get the hang of it, it's and that's pretty quick that um you can really stick anything to anything and it's metal and that's you know it's just exciting <laughs> so um i love i love doing the teaching yeah i will continue to do that i don't do it all a ton because it's i want to do my work still but um but yeah there's um i do a number of classes per year and the, the um the pieces you were describing with the teeth was was that um coming out during the pandemic primarily or did did you have a particular reaction to the pandemic yeah actually i um i i was one of those people that thought oh my gosh what an what an opportunity to um to explore um some different mediums and i started out with with doing some exploration. I mean, it ended up bringing me right back around to the metal work again. So I felt like, oh, okay, there's validation that I'm doing what I need to be doing. Um, but it allowed me also to kind of slow down a bit. I wasn't just responding to deadline after deadline of shows or whatever. And I really, really appreciated the being able to slow down and just kind of play around I mean that so the essence of play kind of came back into the forefront mm -hmm. for me and um, one of the things that appeared during that time I mean not only was there the teeth and all of that kind of thing but there was also um, it was just it was like a coming home in a way of mixing materials um, the the two-part epoxy clay and then also this whole idea of mixing um, charms and talismans and um, amulets that I, it was like I, a jewelry part of me, but, but something deeper, something like these were all parts of a creature. So, I, so then I was making these totem-like pieces that were tall and narrow, but I was adding all of these charms around them and, and, um, some cases it was smaller figures that I was adding around. In other cases, it was it was all sorts of knickknacks and found objects and crystals and everything. But it was a way of saying this is this is the passage that this creature has had. This is the life this creature has had, and these are the experiences, both emotionally and, and physically. And it was just it's kind of like I had been waiting to do the figures like that for a long time. And, and so, yeah, it was, it was really um, satisfying and put me at peace to be able to, to do these kind of figures. And I, I, I don't know if there's another reason for it beyond that, or just that there is still a jewelry part, jewelry making part to me that wants to add that onto these figures and just give them a richness that they've that they didn't have before. And also they're each little, each little um, piece, each little amulet or each little charm is, um, is a symbol of something. And even if it's only something that means a lot to me, I think in other cases, they're more universal symbols too, like seeds for growing and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, it's definitely something that I don't think would have come out unless I had had the time to, to play and to experiment during the pandemic. So for me, it was, it was a very rich time. And I, I've heard some artists say, oh, I, I couldn't do anything. And for me, it was the opposite. It was like, yeah, I'm just going to play. I'm just going to, you know, see what I can do and everything's okay. I'm not going to worry about a deadline anymore. Another thing that I play around with is, um, Years ago, I learned how to etch imagery into brass. And so, I mean, that's yet another thing that I just love etched. Uh, I guess that's a graphic designer thing too for me, but um, taking symbols and old language, um, witchcraft 
craft symbols, um, just sort of like mysticism and all of that. I, I love taking those symbols and etching them into brass and then giving them an ancient quality by firing them and attaching them, um, filling the, the etched area with uh, dark paint. And so it will really stand out more um, than the other shiny part. Uh, when I first started doing that, I was doing all of the etching myself and I was putting, I was creating the blockouts and I was um, creating a saltwater bath that I would put electric current, pass electric current through. So it was kind of like the opposite of, uh, of bronzing baby shoes where the baby shoes collect all of the <laughs> bronze um, molecules and they adhere onto it. So this is actually making the current go the other way. So you have a block out created on your uh, sheet of brass and then you're creating the current. So the current pulls away from that um, blocked out piece of brass. And what happens is all of the areas that are not blocked out just get etched. They get pulled, all the molecules get pulled away. So you get this etched surface. And it's so enormously time consuming affair. And I thought, oh, same thing. I thought, man, there must be an easier way. And uh, so it turns out there is, you go to somebody else who does it for you. <laughs> so I found somebody that, you know, there's lots of companies out there that will etch imagery into metal. And uh, I found one and had massive quantities of imagery done. And it was just so exciting to have sheets and sheets of this metal um, etched for me so I can kind of, you know, play around with it. I feel much more free with it now than I ever did before because it was way precious. Mm. Well, thank you again. And I look forward to meeting you in person. Okay. I look forward to it too, were you? Okay. Well, thank we'll see you later. Okay. Have a okay. Day, Morgan. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Don't miss our latest exhibition featuring figurative sculpture by Morgan Brigg, cyanotype prints by Raymond Jandro, and photography by Ken Smith at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts from July 1st through July 31st.